uh, really one of the great uh, legacies of my predecessor, Michael Miller, uh, who went on to become, uh, he's now the Archbishop of Vancouver, uh, and uh, he really felt we needed a boardroom that was, uh, uh, well, quite frankly, big enough uh, to handle our board. We have a large board. Uh, we added the Labyrinth Garden here uh, about uh, four years ago. Uh, as you know, labyrinths uh, are designed to uh, really have a prayer for reflection. It's, it's really quite touching oftentimes when I think students either come here asking for better grades than their Lord, <laughs> walk the labyrinth saying a Hail Mary every time they make a turn. But it's got a wonderful history. It's actually based on one in, in France, in Chartres, where it's a very famous labyrinth there. And this is modeled uh, after that. So uh, hopefully it, uh, it'll bring back some good memories uh, if you've never been to one before. What I thought might be helpful this evening is to talk about something, you know, that unfortunately is, is almost uh, talked to death. And that's something to hear about, read about, especially in election year. We talk about leadership and family values, and I think we almost sort of glaze over when that thing comes back up. So what I thought might be helpful is to not just take a little bit of my experience in the military and try to relate it to uh, the world that we live in here, but to also add to it uh, some wonderful insights I've gotten uh, from our students. And uh, what I do now is I also teach a, uh, several uh, classes uh, in our MBA course. And that's a great way, you know, to connect with young people because we have a professional MBA. That means that uh, our MBA is offered at night and on Saturdays and virtually all the students are working students. And they're in the, they're the late 20s, early 30s, uh, some a little older. Uh, uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I don't want to mention that, but Ashley, <laughs> Ashley is, is only has two more courses, and he will uh, he will finish our MBA. So I, that, that is a great tribute to this guy right here. <laughs> so you know, I, so I've got some wonderful insights as to, you know everything. Things change; nothing stays the same, and. Uh, one of the great insights I've gotten, which I'll uh, lead off our discussion here, is that, you know, I, I talk to students usually about 20 of them. And uh, so I had this three-hour block and uh, two, uh, one and a half hours each. And so at the end of this block, I, I asked some questions. I said, well, how many of you really like what you're doing and really enjoy what you're doing? You want to stay kind of where you are and you want to do it in some form. What percentage do you think raised their hand? But even that, you know, uh, you ask yourself, well, gosh, you know, if you don't love what you're doing, then why are you doing it? And, you know, we'll talk more about this once I get into it, but the fact of the matter is, is that developing effective, ethical, and enthusiastic leaders, junior leaders, who are going to replace us in the not-for-profit we work in, who are going to replace us in whatever field of endeavor we're in, but this, this is it. I mean, to get young people who get it and who can do it and do it eth ethically and in a way that inspires others, boy, that's worth so much. I'm sure you've all been through situations in which you've had leaders or individuals put in leadership positions. Quite frankly, they may have been great technically, but when you pull them up to a higher level where they have to lead other people, and, you know, there's just tremendous, you know, angst when that happens. It's angst to the person, uh, his or her family, because now, you know, he or she's failed. It's the people that are affected directly, that they're supposed to be leading, of course, are affected because they're unhappy. And then you have to, you know, go out, you have to take that person out, put somebody else in. You know, there's just a lot of pain and sorrow that goes as part of that. So when people ask me, well, what are the challenges that we face, whether you're in the corporate world, the not-for-profit world, whatever, surely finding people like this and grooming them, developing them, educating has got to be at the top of our list. Uh, and again, uh, what I'll try to do this evening uh, is to uh, bring some of those experiences that, uh, that I had in the armed forces. Not that the armed forces have all the answers by any means. But there are certain things, certain golden nuggets that we can pick out, I think, and transfer very quickly and easily, relatively speaking, to the world in which we live. Okay, we'll start off 
with an acronym. You know, the Army loves acronyms. I'll only subject you to one, I promise, this evening. But it's an important one. It's called, <laughs> it's called VUCA. You have to say that. VUCA. It's VUCA. VUCA stands for the world that we live in today. It's volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous. And I think this is an important concept in, for our discussion here today, because oftentimes, you know, I catch people saying, well, you know, the stock market is going up and down, but you know, someday it'll, it'll be back to like it used to be, where it just goes up a lot, up and down a little bit, and we can count on our 401ks. We're thinking about terrorism. Some people say, well, you know, we have these yellow and orange things uh, that, you know, tell us about terrorism. But someday, you know, that terrorism is, you know, it'll be fixed and we don't have to worry about it. This volatile, uncertain world is the reality which we'll be living in for now. And it's going to be the new normal. Now, there's a lot of reasons that we could spend a whole hour discussing that. Uh, I think you probably know some of the reasons for this. And that is that certainly is that the media, which is ever present and growing, brings everything into our living room and in, into our workplaces so that if there is an incident somewhere, it's, it's suddenly known to us, where before we probably didn't know about it, and because we're connected in so many different ways that what happens in China with the uh, with an uh, avian flu epidemic comes to us, you know, the, a week later, and, and then all kinds of things happen, or if there's a terrorist incident in any part of the world, a train, plane flying here from somewhere else, it becomes a witness, and this is going to continue. It's, it, it's, it's never going to go away. So as we think through what is the environment which our young people are going to face challenges in, it's a VUCA environment. I just ask you to kind of keep that in mind as I go through uh, this little presentation. Now, coming from uh, the Army, you know, and the, and, the, and the War College where I was, I have to submit you to one graph. <laughs> this, uh, this graph tries to capture something. And can someone make a, make a guess and perhaps just tell me what, is, what, what are we trying to capture here in one simple, easy, slanted line? You see is the VUCA along the horizontal axis, the compression along the vertical axis, okay? So but the, as you go up the scale, the more VUCA the environment that you're in, if you can follow that. If you go along here, these are organizational levels, whether you're business, education, military, going for all the junior leaders here, so, you know, all the way up to superintendents and CEOs here. So, what does that mean? The higher up you go in an organization, <coughs> the more Booker persists. Precisely. Mm -hmm. a, a CEO clearly has a wider range of responsibility, uh, who has his limits, and so to speak, or her limits are far wider than a junior executive, you know, who wrote to speak and has a job to uh, do sales or management, whatever. Mm -hmm. And this is the traditional traditional way we look at it, right? If you if you have uh, less hair or white hair, uh, you know, supposedly, you know, you're uh, more senior and you're expected to do things, uh, you know, differently and learn through the process. Unless you're like my father-in-law. He says he has blue hair. <laughs> he says, do you have blue hair, Dad? He says, yeah, blue all the way. <laughs> <laughs> but that's kind of the, the traditional model. Now, as I go through these examples, and just two of them, I like to emphasize I think that that traditional model is no longer. And uh, let, let's look at this and see if we can. Um, for those of you that, I know there's one or two of you here that have seen this before, so I see not to, not to spill the beans here. So, uh, <laughs> let, let's look at that picture a second and ask ourselves who has seen that picture before? Give you a hint, it was the New York Times. Go ahead, please. Lawrence of Arabia? No, the right idea, but... Afghanistan. Afghanistan. Kelly, you saw it before. Today. All right, that is indeed, that was a picture out of the New York Times. It came in right after 9-11. And 
And it was, you know, it was a caption like, you know, soldiers ride into battle again. And it, what it really was, see, the guys here who are in white, there's one there and there's one there, there's one back there, uh, ride these skinny ponies. These are American special forces. And shortly after 9-11, uh, these individuals uh, literally parachuted into northern Afghanistan, where a certain number of tribes known as the Northern Alliance were kind of pushed into these corner of, of Afghanistan. And they were still fighting the, uh, the Taliban and Al-Qaeda, who were allied against them. And so what the special forces did, they literally came out of the, out of the blue, uh, dropped in on these tribesmen, and worked with them uh, to, quite frankly, kick the Taliban out of Afghanistan. Well, you can imagine, you know, these guys, are, you know, they're riding ponies because that's all there were. Uh, there's a kind of a famous little uh, vignette, you know, they, they drop these guys in. They, they're based out of Fort Campbell, Kentucky. And so, see, so, you know, they put them on airplanes, and literally a couple of days after 9-11, they drew them in, dropped them in. And you can imagine, you know, these Northern tribes in the city, they're on their campfire, and these guys come out of the sky and say, hey, we're here from Fort Campbell, Kentucky, and we're, we're here to help you. <laughs> what the heck are you? So uh, one of their first radio transmissions back to uh, home base, you know, was came in and find, you know, the people were back there looking at it, you know, and they, they thought, well, what are these guys going to eat? They need food, they need ammo, they need, uh, they need you know, blankets, whatever. And I said, no. He said, send Leather saddles. <laughs> <laughs> because uh, you can't see it obviously here, but the, the Tatsiki tribesmen who they were with had wooden saddles. Oh, wow. 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 These guys would ride these horses for like nine, ten hours a day because they had to cover long distances. And their rear ends were really sore. So actually, what they actually did was they went to Germany, which has plenty of equestrian uh, shops, bought a whole bunch of saddles, put them on an airplane, and parachuted them in. Uh, you know, if that's what it took, that's a pretty small price to pay. But, you know, the caption in the New York Times said, oh, kind of wasn't it sort of, you know, kind of quaint almost, that here we are in the year uh, uh, 2001, and by golly, uh, people are riding horses, and it wasn't that kind of neat. And they really kind of missed the whole point, because these soldiers uh, were very special soldiers. And if I say so, does their, their Marines here as well as uh, Air Force and uh, Navy SEALs incorporated in this group? <coughs> what they were was, was individuals in groups of 12, all who had been carefully trained in terms of language, uh, uh, medical uh, demolitions, uh, ability to empathize with the tribes, and they went into each special force group is assigned a certain part of the world so that they're, they're focused on that in case they're needed. And you know, these people are led by a captain. A captain, you know, usually is about 26, 27, 28 years old, depending upon uh, where, they're, uh, where they're from and what school they went to and so forth. And the rest are sergeants. So there's 10 sergeants uh, who may all have high school at least. Some have uh, maybe one or two years of college. And these people are dropped in, and they were sent to work with Tadziki tribes and chiefs who really were from the 19th century. I mean, that's just the way they were. They were horses and had all kinds of, I mean, swords and outmoded guns and things. Uh, that's all they had. They could imagine coming in and saying, okay, we're here to help you. And uh, by the way, let's, let's ally ourselves against the Taliban. And we want you to trust us. We're going to ride with you up against the Taliban, which at that time were far more numerous, better equipped. They had tanks and everything you could possibly want at that time. And uh, trust us. Just think of the leadership uh, responsibilities that captain had. And these are people who had, or frankly, different ideas on things like, uh, you know, bribery, uh, how to handle combatants or non-combatants. Uh, the whole way of looking at the world was, was drastically different than <coughs> what we have as our values. But yet they were successful. At that time, we only put 600 soldiers in the entire country, and in 39 days, the Taliban were kicked out. And Kabul fell, the Lord Alliance uh, came in, and, and uh, we started to govern. Now, unfortunately, things have deteriorated since then. But in terms of a strictly military operation, coming in, uh, putting pressure on young people to, to, uh, to execute, it was masterfully done. Now, you got to remember, if you think back to 
World War II or any of our previous uh, <coughs> conflicts. You know, you have the, the generals or admirals, you have to have those. Uh, you have, you know, colonels and you have majors and uh, captains and all the way down. But this time there were no, there were no colonels and generals. These were captains. These were young people who had to take on a tremendous leadership uh, challenge and were able to execute. And the reason they were is because there is a concept that came into the armed forces after Vietnam that said we are not going to have this chain of command in terms of waiting for the next guy to give you orders to do something. That you had to have trust in your junior leaders to make decisions on the ground. <coughs> you know, when I talked to my NBA <coughs> students on this, you know, they're kind of dumbfounded because when I asked them, well, in your corporate structure, how much freedom do you have? And the answer is not very, not very uh, affirmative. Uh, sometimes I think that some of our corporates are kind of like the Taliban, you know, uh, it's pretty much, you know, what the boss says, and boy, if you get out of line, you lose it. It's no fun to work in that. I think that's one of the reasons that some of them say, you know, I don't quite frankly like where I work. So this concept of power down, of trusting your junior, has two parts. One, you have to take the courage to do it, but then you have to prepare them to. You just can't go to someone and say, by the way, we're going to back you no matter what. And by golly, uh, uh, I trust you because, you know, that's not fair to them. It's not fair to the organization. So you have to prepare them somehow. You have to have a system and a culture that allows you to, uh, to train and to develop them as individuals. Now, in my class, I've been spending about another hour on something called the after action review. How many of you heard of that term, AAR? Some of you have, okay. The after action review, and I just want to mention this because, you know, usually when I give this class again, or people listen to me, they kind of nod their heads and say, yeah, you should trust your subordinates and you should do that. And that's a good thing. Well, the question comes up, how do you do that? And how do you prepare junior leaders to be effective and enthusiastic? There is where the rub is. Uh, the AAR is called the after action review. Very briefly, what it consists of is a process by which after an operation, it could be a sales initiative, it could be anything. You sit down and you have individuals from all levels of the organization, from the lowest participant to the top participant. And you take the leader of the group and you take him or her out of the process. And they sit in the back of the room, while a facilitator, it could be someone from the same organization, who wasn't directly involved with the operation, sits down with all the people there and says, okay, now our goal was to have a sales initiative that gained X amount of sales. Were we successful? The numbers said yes or no. And then you ask the question, well, why weren't we successful? Well, you know, you can imagine. Things were successful, one's happy and there's clapping, but things aren't always successful. And then all of a sudden it gets down to, well, why wasn't this successful? You know, one of the best ones is I've talked to a group of people who are in the construction industry. This is a, a tough one, you know, because the construction industry so much depends upon subcontractors and people who bring you supplies. So oftentimes when these things are done, people say, well, we weren't successful because the materials weren't there on time. You go say, well, why weren't the materials there on time? Well, because, uh, you know, uh, the, you know, the people who were supposed to order them didn't order them on time. Well, why didn't they order them on time? Well, because uh, Mrs. Susan Smith, who does order the ordering, uh, was on maternity leave, and uh, we didn't cross-train anybody on how to use the software, mm -hmm. so it took a long time to order the stuff, whatever it was. Oh. So the reason that we were unsuccessful with this big project was because we failed to have someone cross-trained because, you know, when Mrs. Smith was pregnant, we certainly knew she was pregnant. It wasn't a surprise to anybody. But we failed to have a backup to order. Now, see, that's an important point to learn. But unless you can get down to that level, and most importantly, have the honesty to get to that level, you'll never learn that. You'll end up saying, 
supplies would be just in time, and go on. So this process, now as AAR, this, I'm giving you a very quick once over on this, requires trust and honesty. You know, in the business, as you know, we've got so many different management fads that come and go, and, and you've seen them all and know about them. Uh, I won't even uh, try to describe it. But this one is so beautiful because it doesn't require consultants, it just requires people to learn what this is about and then have the honesty. Again, when I teach my classes, you know, they all, and I can spend an hour on this, they all, man, this is great. I say, well, can you go do this? Are you nuts? Yeah. <laughs> you want us to get in front of our peers and admit that I did something wrong? It's not like, you get crazy? Like about half of them say, yes, I could do this in my for other half, just shake their head. You got to be nice. So what is really missing here? Honesty and trust that you can say something and maybe point the finger yourself and say, you know, I failed to do something right. And, and you know, I just, that's one of the reasons. But you know, as I tell the class, once you do that, if the leader, for example, gets up and says, you know, I really didn't give you all enough planning time for this. You know what? I pushed this thing through. We should have taken three months to get ready, and I only gave you a month and a half. And you know, I really, I really could have done better on that. Once the leader steps up, who's not supposed to take part in the operation, or just someone admits fault, you know, it has a magnetic effect on people. They say, "Wow, Sam, you know, Sam, you're right, but you know, I could have helped you on that because I, I knew that we had this problem, and I could have raised it, but I forgot to." And all of a sudden, all kinds of great ideas come out about how you could have done it differently. But requires trust and honesty. And this is one of the biggest things that we learned because we went through a whole, like I said, cultural transformation after, uh, after Vietnam, where we said, look, we got all this money, we've got people's lives at stake. Boy, you better be honest. And most importantly, if you were the one who stood up and said something, you know, you didn't get your legs cut out from under you. Is it okay? You came up with it. Admitted that, hey, we could have done something better. Okay, well, it's an exercise. You could have done better. So this process actually is, is, is well known to different firms throughout the United States. Nestle's of America, for example, which is where my, my dear sister works, uh, has embraced this. And, and uh, I had some very interesting discussions with the folks there who have really taken this even the next step further. So I, I bring that out to you because I think that we, we talk about some of these things like trust, and we talk about effective leaders, people say, okay, I buy into that, but tell me how to do that. And this, this process, which is, again, just a process which can be integrated into the way you do your business, and again, I'm just giving you a very quick once over on this, uh, is, uh, is a great way to do it. And, and uh, we've talked about this, I've been, uh, the AR talked to a number of different groups here in town, and I think they found it very useful. So, the after action review is a way in which these captains have learned to be honest, and we sat down with their sergeants at night to make a difference. If you're a sergeant or a captain, you say, hey, what's going well? What isn't going well? People still said, look, you know, we're really messed up here. We got to change. And that was the real reason behind this revolution. Not just the fact that, you know, they had uh, laser uh, designators around their necks, which told them where they were in those days. Uh, I'm sorry, GPSs. <coughs> Not laser designators. Uh, GPSs around their necks, which told them where they were. That was helpful. They could leverage technology. Uh, you know, they had laser designators, and those are, those are weapons that shoot a laser beam at, the, at your target. It's invisible to the eye. It can go about uh, two, 3,000 meters. Hmm. And so if you see a bad guy, so to speak, you can laze it, and an airplane flying 20, 30,000 feet up can drop a laser-seeking warhead, which sees where that laser beam is and follows that laser beam like a 95% so, you know, if you see something, and it, it's a tremendous impact, it was a tremendous impact to the Taliban, who were, who were thought they were hiding, and all of a sudden, without any warning, a bomb hits you and, uh, and uh, obliterates the position. But if you're next to a mosque, God willing, you won't be hurt. So, the special forces had technology on their side, don't get me wrong, it wasn't just these techniques, but you have to be able to use that technology in an effective way. Okay, those are AARs. Let's look at this picture. Who has seen this? Who wants to guess at what this is? 
Close, very close, very close. Actually, that is Bosnia. You know, you're only a, you're only a, uh, a country away. Uh, this is a scene, you know, that was repeated in those days many, many times. And what you see here in the, in the Humvee there in the back is obviously an American Humvee, which in the front is a, a Dutch vehicle. This is a Dutch American patrol. And this scene was repeated many, many times uh, in, in different villages in Bosnia and later in Kosovo. And what these were, of course, small units, usually platoons, about 30 soldiers, whose responsibility it was to keep the various factions from killing each other. There are Serbs and Croats, and there, are, there are Muslims and Serbs, all different combinations. Unfortunately, there have been, as you know, a tremendous ethnic cleansing <coughs> that went on, which was thousands of people killed on. And what happened then is the American forces primarily came in, uh, with others in support. Uh, they put these platoons into each of the villages, who actually lived in the villages. Now, a platoon is led by a lieutenant who's maybe 22, 23, 24 years old, usually fresh out of ROTC or West Point, wherever they went to school. And all of a sudden, you know, they were thrown in these situations which were unbelievably volatile, and they're thrust in positions to do things that I'm sure they never studied in school. Because, you know, when you're the platoon leader, you, you are the man. You, you have the power. And so the village mayor comes to you and says, you know, the trash is piling up. You say, well, why is the trash piling up? I said, the trash is piling up because the driver of the, uh, of the uh, trash truck is a Serbian, and he won't take his truck into the Bosnian neighborhood because he's worried about getting stones thrown at him. So the trash is piling up. We've got a tremendous problem with sanitation. Or the schools won't open. Well, why won't the schools open? Well, the schools won't open because the, the Serbian kids will not go to school with the Croat kids. They won't sit in the same classroom with them, and they'll go in the open schools. So some of these young lieutenants, you know, they had responsibilities to get the schools going, to get sanitation going, to figure out, you know, who owns what, because a lot of these places, you know, for example, the Serbs came in, drove out the Muslim families, they then put Serb families in there who lived there maybe a year or two, the Muslim families came back and said, hey, I want my farm back. Sir Pence, well, look, you know, I lost my farm to the Croats last year, so I, I got this farm in, in uh, return. So whose farm is it? Well, these situations required these platoon leaders to have a sense of values, you know, a basic understanding of what was right and what, what was wrong, even though they're facing far different cultures. You know, by and large, you did a magnificent job. Because if you look at this picture, you know, you can obviously see crowds around and so forth. And there's lots of incidents in which they were pelted with tomatoes and, and rocks. But there wasn't a, a single time that our forces ever opened fire on a crowd the entire time that we were in Bosnia. That says an awful lot for the restraint uh, and the intelligence and the sense of right and wrong that our leaders had. It was a tremendous uh, tribute to them. And you say, well, how do you get a sense of values? Well, unfortunately, there's no technique to instill a sense of values into people. I believe uh, that it's a, it's a process of education. And that you, know, you can get it in your church or synagogue. You can get it in your college or university. You can get it from your parents. But is it just, you know, Kind of a base, they simply have to really think through what is right and what is wrong in this situation, and, and come to some sort of a some sort of a decision, and then carry it out. That's one thing. So we're very proud of here at St. Thomas, as we say, we we educate leaders of faith and character, because you know we feel that you have to have a faith base. That's, that's our assumption. We have to have a faith base, whether regardless of what field that you go into. And that isn't just so you can take a course on. You say, okay, we have an ethical course 101, and now I have my ethics and I'm all set. No, it's, it's a combination of Shakespeare and Plato and Thomas Aquinas and, you know, talking about things from, from uh, globalization to immigration policy to uh, social justice to uh, <coughs> medical ethics to cloning to whatever. These are things you have to talk about and you have to come up with a sense of values. Uh, you know, 
that our campus here, you know, is based upon that dialogue we call between faith and reason. You have the chapel on one side, which represents faith. You have the library at the other side, which represents reason. Now, one of those, uh, obviously, reason, which represents knowledge, is always changing. You know, I mean, gosh, there's new technology, new discoveries. So there's this dynamic that takes place. On the other hand, you have faith, which is your beliefs, and that obviously tends to stay the same. So you have the academic departments in between, and they're very actively involved. Okay, what, what's changed? What hasn't changed? And it's an educational period, an educational process. And uh, again, I think that uh, the Army tried to do its part to instill a sense of values in people, but there's no way you can do that, you know, in a couple of weeks or months. Uh, but again, we were very fortunate that in this situation, the sense of values, what was right, what was wrong, certainly paid off for us, and it's something I think you have to get through education. So this is kind of why I think uh, we have some wonderful examples that can make a difference in the corporate not-for-profit world. And I found that uh, those corporations which really take ethics seriously, uh, take development seriously, tend to do very well. I'll close with a very short story. Uh, as some of you know, my last duty assignment was at the Army War College in Carlisle, Pennsylvania, which is a, a, a year-long course for senior leaders in the armed forces. Uh, it's got about 400-some students. About 40 of them are from other countries, though, and they're integrated into the class. It's actually a, it's a, it's a degree-producing school. You get a master's uh, at the end of it. And what, what they try to do, you know, is they try to bring these various cultures and various groups uh, to talk to each other. One of the things that we do, or they did, uh, was they go to the Gettysburg Valley. Have you ever been to Gettysburg? Some of you probably have. Good. Well, it's, it's, it's a beautiful place if you haven't gone, because they preserved it pretty much like it was back in 1863, 1864. And as a result, you can, you can kind of visualize how everything happened. And it's a very compact place. So you can One day you can see the whole thing. And so we had a uh, program at that time there that you could, we brought congressmen and senators who wanted to talk about their, you know, their leadership issues. And we said, well, look, why don't you go to Gettysburg and let's show you the battlefield and you may find some interesting insights. And so on the way home from uh, one of these tours, at uh, that time uh, we took about 15 people. We had a group of senior executives who were CEOs of various companies along the East Coast. So I'm sitting there with this gentleman, and I said, well, what'd you think? Uh, he saw it, thought it was a great, great trip, and you know, talking about developing junior leaders, we talked a lot about that. I said, well, tell me, what, what do you do in your company? Now, this gentleman was the head of a group called American Infrastructure, American Structure, excuse me, out of Philadelphia. He was an engineering company. And he was kind of a modest guy. He said to me, well, you know, he says, uh, you know, we get about 18, roughly, engineers every year. Now, the competition for engineers is, was very, uh, I say fierce, then, fierce now even, because engineers in certain uh, categories are very hard to come by. He said, you know, what we do is that uh, when they come in here, uh, we kind of break them up into different groups, and then we have a program to, uh, to teach them our values. I said, well, how does that work? Well, he says, I take a half a day every month, and we have a seminar. So the 18 students come in, or 18 young graduates come in, and I say, well, what is the mission of our a company? And we talk about what does that really mean, not just the thing on the, you know, on the, uh, uh, on the wall we say our mission is and our values are. So we, we talk about it. Then they, the next month we talk about how we treat our customers. The next month we talk about how we treat ourselves. And he says, once a year we take a retreat. And we go up to the Poconos where we spend about two or three days. As you bring in, you know, usually a well-known speaker. Mentioned uh, what's the name? Uh, Collins from Good to Great, uh, you know, famous, uh, uh, famous guy, or someone well known. We read the book beforehand. We talk about, well, what what is this consistent? Then he says, when the when the when the uh, graduates, uh, when the uh, young uh, uh, workers come back, <coughs> engineers, he said, I, I I have a three sixty degree. Uh, analysis made of, you know, have you done a 360 where you rate it by your peers, you know, your superiors and your subordinates? And so at the end of about a year and a half, I sit down with each of those engineers. And I say, well, here are the 360s that you said. Of course, I know most of them. I say, you know, Susan, you did a great job. 
But you know, you just you just don't really fit into the culture of what we're trying to do. And wish you the very best. But uh, you know, I think I'd let you go. Or call them in and say, you know, you did a great job, and here's all the reports and evaluations of you, and we think you'd be great in marketing or design. He says, you know, the beauty is, is that whether they stay or not, they're thankful for the experience because look at all the time that we have really lavished upon them in terms of giving them feedback on their strengths and weaknesses, taking time to teach them on what we think are important things like values and mission and, and all those things that people just sometimes put on the board. And the majority stay with us. And you know, he says lots of other companies have trouble retaining their people. I says, we don't have trouble retaining our people. Because we take the time to train, to educate, and develop them as few others do. He said, wow. You know, wow, what a program. I mean, how many CEOs are willing to take a half a day a month and devote it to preparing their junior leaders. Not a consultant, uh, <coughs> not some you know, latest fad, but just honestly talking about your values of your corporation <coughs> what you stand for with the boss doing it. So you know, there are ways, I think, that uh, we can do things like uh, develop ethical, enthusiastic, effective leaders. Uh, you know, this one, again, came from an engineering company. I think there are other good things out there, other good practices, I should say, I'm sure that you have heard about. But the key is you've got to make the effort and the commitment to do something. Uh, because to do nothing uh, just invites disaster. Uh, disaster, I think, for your own company or corporation, not for profit, when suddenly, oh my gosh, who do we get in this position that we need someone in and you don't have someone? Or you allow a culture to develop and it's either just bottom line oriented which in itself, in the long run, cannot be helpful. Uh, or you're, we're banking not focused enough, and you lose out that way. So these are just you know, some of the things that uh, I think might be helpful. I'd be more happy to take any questions that you may have. on you, your perception of the customer within an organization. The a customer? Of, yeah, the customer within the organization. A lot of times we're focused outwardly, but that to me is always an interesting challenge. Uh, I'm sorry, I don't know your name. Uh, Deborah Mance, Field Deborah. and Technology. Are you familiar with the uh, concept of servant leadership? You know, I say, you know what I mean by that term? There's no way you know I hate to say buzzwords that came up. I think one of the, however, helpful, uh, I should say, concepts out of that concept of certain leadership is it takes the concept of leadership and turns it on its head. Because a typical leadership, you know, we look at the CEO and the junior, uh, senior managers, junior managers, workers, and, and at the bottom, who are the ones who are really uh, working with the customer? It's, it's the workers, right? The salespeople, whatever the case may be. So as soon as you take this and turns it upside down and says, look, in order to be successful, the customer is the one at the top. He or she's the one you've got to please or work on. And instead of looking always, you know, worrying about your boss, you've got to be looking up and looking at the customer. And the bottom person is the CEO who should be worried about helping the, uh, the senior managers. The senior man manager should be saying, well, how can I help the junior managers? And, you know, again, this is just a, a quick once over. Mm -hmm. So I, please excuse me, but it's a very valid concept is that you've got to somehow turn this whole thing on its head and say, look, the reason we're here is the customer. So what am I doing to help my supposedly subordinates help their subordinates so the people who are in touch with the customer, the workers, are actually at the top of the heap, not the bottom of the heap. And if you, if you think through that, it puts a whole different twist on it. Mm -hmm. And I think it could be very helpful. Because you know, we're, many of us are just set on this old, quite frankly, military thing. We had one general, all the colonels, and everything. That's 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 not valid. Thank you. You even in the military. Well, you know, sometimes people say, "Oh, well, you know, you have these military ideas." I would, uh, you know, the military you just give an order, and people do what you know what you want. Well, 
Yeah, it's not quite that way. Uh, sure, people have to do what you tell, but the number one, the American soldier always does well when he or she understands what the purpose is behind the order. And you don't always have that luxury to do that. And the second is, you know, once you get past a certain grade in the armed forces, you know, you're working with other countries, you're working with the State Department, CIA, FBI, whatever, and you can't order those people around because they're, they're your peers. So you've got to develop techniques that are far more than just, okay, do it because I said do it. And I think that's a, a very good point, that obviously there are times of crisis when you have to make sure your orders are, are followed. But you know, quite frankly, those are far fewer than most people re, uh, realize. Any other questions? <coughs> the CEO you described, did uh, he spend any time talking with you about, or was it inherent in uh, his story to you that they lived those values as well as taught? Well, he was kind of a, or like a modest guy, and I think that, I think just from his demeanor and the way that he, that he kind of explained the story to me over about a half hour period, it seemed to me that you know, he was pretty confident what he was doing. This wasn't just something that they thought of uh, a week ago, but something that had become part of their culture. <coughs> that, uh, and I think it was probably caused initially by the fact that there was such fierce competition for young engineers. So he went to Virginia Tech or MIT, where he went to bring in the very best, you know. He knew that, by God, people were watching, they would try to take us in. So maybe it came from a, a very selfish purpose. I, 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 don't, I don't really know. Uh, but whatever caused it, it certainly brought about something I think they all benefited from. Just a comment, yes. too. I mean, if I worked in human resources for an awful long time and, uh, in quite large and small organizations, and one of the things that I always observed about people as a group workers is that if the managers don't walk the talk, they're really not respected that much. So the ones that actually do what they say everyone else should do are the ones that get most success from their people as a general rule. So that helps them walk the talk. <laughs> uh, yes. Can I ask you a question about the, talk about the asset after action you do? Yes. And the requirement of honesty and trust. Mm -hmm. and I guess the question is, do you, uh, do you worry about, do you see honesty and trust in the business world increasing or decreasing? Worry about the sort of the tentative hold, the, the, the lack of a sense of commitment on the part of business that individuals are doing. That, that they need to be better. That's a very good question. And you know, Steve, I don't have enough of a broad view of business to answer that question very well. I can only tell you what I see <coughs> from the students. And then, you know, we have some students who work for large corporations, some who work for startups. Some were changing jobs, so we have a nice cross section of these various classes that uh, that uh, we have here. I would say that the competition is really bearing down. I think there's more stress on them. Uh, I think that it's harder to have these values and look at the long term impact and not just worry about well, what's the next quarter's earnings. Mm -hmm. yeah. So this is a very tough period, and uh, I, I wish I could give you a better answer than that, but I. I think it's, it, it's tough. You know, if I can make a generalization, the, the students uh, who seem to be the happiest are the ones who are in small business. And they, they'll say, well, you know, we have about uh, 20 people working for us. Yeah, I think we could do this. I could talk to Boston to do this. Uh, the bigger organizations, and again, this is a generalization, uh, they seem to have, uh, they're much more reluctant <laughs> So yeah, I'll, I'll do this tomorrow. Yeah. Well, you said for smaller groups, for these groups that keep a smaller focus on the on, the, uh, on the, their immediate work, workforce. Yes. Where do you think the best resources can be found in Houston on the topic of ethical leadership? Clearly, you have a wonderful program here. I'm not familiar with the resources available to to non-students and. and Again, I'm only really familiar with our uh, MBA course. And you know, I, but it's not, it's not so much it's a course, but the, the approach that you take to education. It isn't just a question of knocking out credits. Sometimes, oh man, if I, if I do this, I can, I can get credits, or I can get my course, 
Uh, my, my degree just in just a year and a half. Oh, man, I just, I just cringe when I hear that, you know? Because education should be a, something that lasts much more than just getting a degree. I know that that seems when you're, 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 your money's tight and you think, oh, yeah, it's easy for you to say, you know, you want that student to stay. But by golly, I think that's the truth. And that is that it should be something that really changes you because it forces you to think about things, about what's right, what's wrong, you know, the many sides of immigration or globalization or not just, you know, what is the, how can I get enough credit to get by? And so oftentimes when uh, students come to me and ask that question, well, how long will it take? You know, I try to backtrack and say, you know, this, this is, it's more than just this. And gosh, you're putting so much money into this, you've got to get more out of it. It isn't just, you know, <clears throat> trying to find the, the cheapest product. I don't mean to say that one way is better than another, because every school has its great, uh, great programs and, and not great programs, I guess. So anyway, I, I think that it's got to be integrated with who you are, and that takes a little time. It just takes a little time. And sometimes you can get that, you know, we have a great guy, John Whitney here, some of you know. Uh, John is our uh, professor of uh, leadership. And he, he came from Columbia, he was a professor emeritus at Columbia, a very unusual guy only has his bachelor's degree and was a professor emeritus from Columbia, New York. He came down here and he, and uh, what he was famous for is turning companies around. So, you know, so he has a senior, uh, he has a seminar here for the people in the last year of MBAs. And uh, so, he, you know, people come in thinking, wow, we're the, the, you know, the top six things I gotta do to turn around a company or whatever. You know what he talks about? He talks about Shakespeare. Just, Shakespeare get nuts. And, you know, they just, he says, bear with me. And you think he brings out some of these really issues that are at the crux of, you know, units that are you know, corporations that took a nosedive and those that did. It's based on, you know, <coughs> what was right and what was wrong. Uh, you know, he makes them read the Magna Carta. <laughs> People are just kind of stunned at first. But, you know, he then draws out from there whole ideas of where is the idea of the worth of the individual, the dignity, and entrepreneurship, all these things he kind of just pulls out of there. And all of a sudden you see things a lot differently than if you had a checklist that, okay, if you do these six things, you'll be a great leader. So again, I'm sorry it's a long answer to a very good question, but you know, it, it just takes time. And I think that that's the one thing that we have to give ourselves. Now, one good aspect of this, of this downturn is that more and more people are taking the time to go back to school. Mm -hmm. Because they think, you know, when this is gonna, when this downturn's gonna be over, and it's gonna be over someday, you know, I'm going to be ready and prepared to take that next one because now I've got this education uh, to help me get to the next one. Yeah. No one's staying between you and the dinner dinner plate. <laughs> <laughs> so I just want to. Uh, yeah. Okay. One last There's question. There's always one. You know, one last question. I've been restraining myself, <laughs> but it, it, I'd love to hear your comment on the the tension between forced rankings in performance reviews where you know that the lowest third, you're gone, bye-bye, and creating this trust that you're talking about for a, for a truly open after-action review. Uh, you know, how, how do you, because you want, you want high performers in your organization, but at the same time, how do you create this, this culture of failing forward? And, you know, we're not gonna chop you off the ankles because you blew it one time. We want you to learn from that. <coughs> That's tough. Uh, I, I know that there are companies in the Army for a while went through that help, same process. Uh, and to some degree still does with the, you know, the lower third or whatever. Uh, it's up or out, it's called. If you're passed over at least twice, you're out. So it's, uh, it's, a, it's a tough culture. Uh, I guess I would say is that our responsibility is to do all we can in the developmental stage and how how we rate them at the end is not as important as if we do our job trying to bring them up. And quite frankly, you know, the ones who don't do well, rarely it's because they're stupid or they don't want to work. I mean, the people who, for, usually they're not in the right job or they're in the wrong field or this, is, this isn't what you want to do. But instead they get stamped and say, okay, you're out of because you're in the bottom third. But if, you had, if we had spent some time with them, they'd be on the way up and say, look, you know, you know, it should not be in sales. You should be in something else, or maybe you're in a totally different area. So uh, there's no easy answer to your question because I know that's what a lot of corporations do, and that's that's part of the culture. By golly, uh, if we pay more attention to bringing them up, I think some of those issues will solve themselves, and we're not forced into uh, putting people in thirds, which which can be very destructive. 
Uh, you know, once, once you know, someone stands up and wins AR and says the truth, and they're fired, I guarantee you, you just lost. You might as well throw the whole thing out. There's, there's not going to be another person who says another thing. So it's very, very. But on the other hand, just think of all the time you waste when people do one of these at these various, uh, you know, the building industry calls them post mortems, or what? Bad term. Uh, <laughs> but you know, think of all the time you waste and you give the wrong lessons out of what you've just done because people, quite frank, are not going to speak up and say what really happened. I always talk about, this, you know, we had to say, I'll never forget one time with a very quick story. The sergeant was there, and the enemy, we were in, in the deserts of California, the enemy got behind the unit, you know, surprised us and, and wreaked havoc and so forth. And we're all trying to figure out what happened, you know. And one sergeant says, well, he says, what happened was I fell asleep. Yeah, he says, I was supposed to be guarding this pass. Uh, my vehicle was there, and I fell asleep. And the enemy got behind. I didn't know about it until the heck they had bunch of tanks to us. Well, you know, if he had not said that, we would have spent hours trying to figure out what was wrong with the plan. Mm -hmm. But he had the courage to say that. But the neat thing was, we said, well, why did Sergeant Jones fall asleep? Well, it turns out that Sergeant Jones had been on guard duty like for 17 hours. Mm -hmm. We said, well, gee, why, why was Jones on guard duty for 17 hours? Well, because uh, Lieutenant Smith didn't have enough men to cover his sector so we had to get everybody a wider sector. Ah, well, why did Lieutenant Smith have such a wide sector? <laughs> ah, because Captain Wilson uh, messed up and said, oh, we can cover that area, and told the colonel, we can cover that area, my, my, my men can cover that. And it was way too big. So all of a sudden, you know, it, the whole thing has changed around. This isn't poor Sergeant Jones. <laughs> it's the guy, Captain Wilson, who bit off more than he could chew. It's even worse because probably Colonel Ivany or whoever should have known, hey, listen, the company can't take that big a sector of the desert. They're going to take this big a sector. So again, you see how, how a different, a different, a whole different lesson you get out of it and poor Sergeant falling asleep because he was willing to, to talk up and people were able to say, yeah, this is why the enemy got behind us. Colonel gave too big a sector. That's why I oh. trust that was the only person. That's right. <laughs> Well, thank you very much. And that uh, completes the program. Thank you all for being here at the Center for Houston Future. Uh, we're very appreciative of your interest. And uh, if you want more information, the staff is here to help. <laughs> and uh, so uh, we'll wish you a good evening. Thank you.